Or number two, is some new process been injected that I don't know about that is now costing this individual time and thus ability to, to be creative and adaptive? So I'll start with the first one. If, if these individuals are dragging on something because they have nothing else to do, it, think about the last time you went to an event you just didn't want to right? You're actually bringing out, you're putting on a performance and you're bringing out emotions that are not natural. You're mm -hmm. forcing emotion. And when you do that, you're suppressing your natural emotions and you're actually exhausting willpower. You are like, you, you come back from that thing and you're just completely wild. You're exhausted because you've had to, you've had to be something that you're not, right? Mm -hmm. Like they show that actors, when they, actors and actresses, when, when they're in character, their brains are fired off there and it's exhausting. It's the same thing here. So if we act like we're working, we're actually, we're like seven to eight times less efficient cognitively and emotionally and, and the like than we are if we're actually working. Wow. So that's a big risk factor for these folks. So, so if I got nothing to do, what am I doing? Brandon Smith Show, and of course, I'm your host, Brandon Smith, and the entire purpose of this show is one singular thing, and that is to help you live a life that much more free from dysfunction. And so as I think about uh, a manager and a leader, one of the ways dysfunction pops up is the fire that all of a sudden gets created when your best team player gives the knock on the door and says, hey boss, I'm leaving. I'm taking another job, or this isn't working out for me, or whatever happens to be. So this show is going to be all about what are those warning signs that your folks, your players on your team, uh, maybe even top performers are about ready to leave. And so to help guide us on that journey, I've got an expert in this space, Dr. John Christensen. John, so good to have you on the show. And thank you very much for having me as well. Yeah, I am just thrilled about this conversation and where it's going to go. So I yeah. want to make sure but I, I properly um, introduce you. So you've got a couple titles. You're both Chief Intelligence Officer of Sparks Research and Correct. the Managing Director of Ins and Outs, another firm. Um, mm -hmm. So I know you do a lot kind of in this kind of predictive analytics kind of, kind of space. Um, yeah. Tell us a little bit more about, about you, the kind of work you do, and then we're going to dive into some of those signs that as our, our managers and leaders listening right now can can be on the lookout for. Right. So um, Sparks Research is actually a full-service marketing research firm. Um, we do a lot of consumer and employee research, uh, a lot of product and concept testing and the like. Uh, and then Ins and Outs is a, it's an insight generation firm, largely in the machine learning predictive analytics space. Um, so we kind of had uh, kind of both sides of, of the insight generation and investigation uh, type world to uh, essentially put our clients in the best position to make actionable decisions that are backed by data and, and really hard, good modeling. Um, my background largely is in that. I come from an economics and econometrics background, um, and that's kind of where I, I took my career. Uh, and it's, it's a world of fun, and it's amazing to take uh, what computers can do and, and generate insight that really kind of helps us understand our customers, our, our employees, our managers, uh, and, and really uh, consumers and society as well. So uh, great to be here. I love this topic. I love to get into this uh, with my graduate students and, and anybody that wants to listen. So thanks so much for having me. Yeah, I'm so thrilled to have you on here. So I love it. I love everything you do. And it's, I think what's beautiful about that is it's, it's almost like if I simplified what you do, it's like you're, we have all this data and information. How can we really harness it and right. harvest it so we can predict stuff that's about to happen? Whether exactly. That's, whether that's with consumers or whether that's with employees or whether, whatever it happens to be, how can we kind of get in front of that by using information we already have at our disposal? Just how do we get smarter about gathering it and using it? Cool. Nice. Uh, all right. So let's, let's take that and focus in on this one lens of disgruntled employees. And, and yeah. I think part of what was interesting was, um, and this was something that uh, we got from you, that th there's a rise of employees quitting their jobs. So in January, there was 3.5 million employees quit their jobs in January alone, the highest quit rate in 15 years. And I'm seeing this with a lot of my clients. I mean, they're, they're running into two problems. One, it, it's hard to keep the talent that they've got. And two, it's hard to find talent that they need. So it's like if someone does walk out the door, the ability to replace them tomorrow is not very high. It's very difficult yeah. to do. So keeping that talent is really, really, really critical. Hence, you come in. How can I predict and, and be able to determine when someone might be about to 
about to exit and can hit the sidewalk because I don't want them to. So what are some of the things, what are tips and guidance you might be able to give us? What are some of the things that you've noticed or seen or learned? Well, so the, the first thing I want to kind of lay out is, is how the labor market's really changed. Like the days of the 25 to 35 years in a gold watch and a retirement party really don't exist the way that they did uh, in, in prior days because you're kind of seeing a lot of the, in order to move up, you have to move out. And that becomes a real challenge mm. when you're trying to keep your best talent uh, in-house. And, you know, as a manager, it gets tough because it, it, it gets to the point where it's like, I really don't have many places to take this individual uh, in the immediate term, but I know there are places they can go outside of that, right? You see this in college football. You see this in computer science and analytics. And pro, you see it kind of all over the place. So what we really, I think, want to talk about here, though, is what are some, some things we really want to be looking out for so that we can not necessarily run interference, but really be aware so that we can change the environment for our employees uh, and put them in a better position to harness their creativity, be adaptive um, and the like. So I like to kind of go through questions. And one question that I think is the most uh, prominent one is how much control does an employee have over their tasks and the ultimate outcome, which is their performance. So think of it this way. If, if I'm evaluated on my job performance and in order for me to effectively perform, let's say I have to produce a report by Friday at five o'clock, but I have to wait for the finance team to provide me their data. And then I need um, maybe creative or account or whoever over here to provide me what they need so that I can produce this, this aggregated analytics report. Well, if, if finance has been sitting on their hands all this time or, or you know, account or vice, you know, what have you, and then I get all this stuff and it's two days late, I don't have the time window in order to make this work. So I, I, am, I have become reliant on a process, uh, which that's what this gets at, process constraints. Yeah. If, if I don't have control over that end product because I have, I have to wait for something to come ahead of time or have to wait for permission to do something or some magic window, you're really limiting my ability to effectively hit that mark. Like I, I don't, I can't get creative anymore. I can't get innovative anymore. I can't, I have no adaptability. I just have to get the work done by that. point, Right. Yeah. So you put me in that environment and not only have you, you stifled me by time, you've, you've, wasted a lot of my of my resource and then what am i doing while i'm waiting right so there's this level of boredom and, and then all of a sudden i'm drinking from a fire hose to try to get this thing done so you as a manager to identify that um and say okay what can we do about this process because this individual really has some real talent but we're not doing we're not doing them any favors right? yeah. does that make sense oh my gosh it makes tremendous sense but <laughs> It, it does, but it almost begs like a, a, a bigger question because what you're hinting on, you're, so I, when I heard of this was a couple of things. At the employee level, the two words that came to mind were agency and empowerment. Mm -hmm. How can you give this person agency, right? Some sense of ownership and then empowerment, equip them to go do it. Okay, so that's great. But then you go into a big company, like anything over 3 billion in revenue. And my, my experience has been once a company goes to, hits 3 billion, they morph from being a company into a government. And, yeah. and so then, the, then you've got bureaucracy and, mm -hmm. and, and the organizational structure du jour is a matrix organization, right? So sure. we're going to be all matrix, which means exactly like you said, we're all going to have dotted lines to each other. So yeah. you're going to be relying on um, finance and this other department for anything that you want. And you've got to all right. kind of figure out how to do that. So it's, it's, it's tricky. It's a, it becomes tricky when we start to look at it through that lens because it's like, but if you work in a big company, you're going to have some of these bureau, bureaucratic things. And mm -hmm. so how do you as a manager and leader, I guess, I guess I'm coming to the answer that you're trying to get me to. I'm just slow. Um, <laughs> is that how do I run, and you used, used this word earlier, but how do I run interference? How do I run interference as the manager or leader to kind of cut through some of the frustration of this clunky process so my employee can feel a sense of agency, so they can feel a sense of empowerment? Right. Well, I mean, honestly, the the... the the first thing you have to, to say is you can only control what you can control, which is fortunate and unfortunate because it, it kind of, it essentially gives us a, a rule set. If 
play by, right? So if we know the rules and our employees know the rules like uh, of kind of pay to play and the like, then we know how we can navigate them. Um, the best thing that a manager can do really like in terms of putting is really just to know, all right, can I change the environment a little bit to make this a, a more conducive situation so that this individual uh, can can hit them hit the mark maybe it's add a little pressure maybe it's subtract a little pressure right maybe it's to, to in, like put a little conflict into another team to get it done right as managers you know if you know that you know this employee is relying on other departments well you should have some some kind of cross uh, awareness or, or cross situational awareness of what's going on to be able to go to those other people and say hey man like we got to get this going yeah. um yeah you know I, I love it. And I think even even the simplest thing, the takeaway that I got, if I simplified it even more, I think one of the best things we can do as managers, just picking on that one point you just gave, was ask your employees, is there yeah. a process or something that's frustrating you that, yeah. I, that I should be aware of? Aware of? Right. Uh, and, and, right. And, and what would it look like if it ran be better or what could I be doing to, you know, it, it's kind of the stop, start, continue question. What could I be doing, start doing to support you better? What could I stop doing that's getting in your way or, or prevent something that's getting in your way? What could I continue doing that's working for you? Right. And, I, and let me add a layer to that, if I will, Brandon. So um, you also have to be able to kind of like if you get really get to know your employees in a room and you start to see a pattern where um you know that this specific employee is not afraid to, to, to ask a question like, what are we even doing this for? Or why are we doing it this way? Or can I, can I throw an idea out to you? And then now you come to them and say, or, or like now you start to see that change, right? Um, the example I love that you gave um, in a recent episode you did was about a manager that told a joke and it worked up the chain to HR and it was, okay, well, I'm not going to do that, again, right? I, yeah. I'm not even going to go down that road. So, um, that's, that's an element of what, what's called psychological safety. Yeah. And we, we managers, leaders need to be cognizant that we are creating environments that, uh, somebody needs to be able to say, Hey, this process is broken and not feel like there's going to be any repercussions for it. No, no, you know, it's not going to work up the chain to HR. You should, they should feel comfortable to be able to tell you this because like the minute you kind of start to violate that, they're going to silo off and like there's disconnect, disengagement. And the, and the first opportunity that looks like I'll have a better cultural fit than it, then there's probably going to get out the door. Yeah. So being able to create that environment of psychological safety. So people do feel comfortable right. show, sharing with you something that's broken or throwing out a half baked idea or giving yeah. you information early that maybe isn't good information, but they don't want to be shot as the messenger. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and I'll give you, I'll give you an example. Um, you know, I, I had a, a friend a couple of years ago, like front end programmer, and he found a way to restructure the code so that it just optimized much easier. It wasn't thousands of lines. Now we just condensed it to like a hundred. And he went to his manager, who is the owner of the code. Not only did was he the owner of the code, he wrote the original code. And he mm -hmm. said, "Hey, I just want to show you what I'm working on to see if this is something that maybe you want to get behind." And the guy looks at him. He's like, "Yeah." Can we, do you want to present that to the team? Because they need to, we need to do this. So basically, he had the freedom and ability to be able to go to his manager and say, hey, dude, I know that this is like your baby and you built all this front end, and I, but I think I found something to do this better. For, for him to know that he could do that, and for the manager to react and say, like to have the humility to say, yeah, this is great, and now I'm going to empower you, like you said, uh, and put you in a position to, to do that and also take some ownership of it and present it to the team yourself as you discover it. Yeah, that's beautiful. Okay, so I know we're rolling into break. So when we come back, I want to continue down this path. I want to kind of pick your brain on a few more. What are some other yeah. things that we could be looking out for as managers yeah. that are, are warning signs that if we don't have these in place, our folks could be at risk of packing up and hitting the door? Absolutely. Uh, all right, so we're going to roll into break. Uh, stay tuned. We'll be right back. Here's your coaching minute for the week, presented to you by the Leadership Foundry. Dysfunction in the workplace, it's a pervasive problem. Here's a simple tip to eliminate dysfunction, both in your team, but even in the environments around you. Clarify your team members' roles, goals, and responsibilities. 
So just spend some time thinking about, does all of my team know? Does each of them know what their role is, what the goals are of the team and their responsibilities? If the answer is yes. You right there eliminate 50% of the, all the dysfunction that could come up in your team. If the answer is no. Think about how you could do that better. When we don't do that, one of two things happens. Either people overlap work and they step on each other's toes, or you have one person carrying much bigger load while a couple other people are hanging out, not doing near as much work. It's one of the big problems in the nonprofit world is a lack of clarity around roles, goals, and responsibilities. So focus on those three things. And I promise you, not only will you eliminate dysfunction, it's going to make your workplace that much more enjoyable. Welcome back from break. Of course, this is the Brain and Smith Show. And right before break, um, John was taking us through some ideas on what are some of those key things we need to be looking out for as a manager, as a leader, those indicators that if we don't address these, these could be the things that could push our employees out the door. And in the job market we're in today, that is not where we want to be. So I know the last one we talked about, John, right before break was, of course, the idea of psychological safety, creating that environment for the manager. So we first talked about processes, making sure that we were eliminating clunky processes, making our employees have a smooth kind of path to success. And then you talked about psychological safety. Uh, what's next? So the next big question really is, is the consistency. How consistent are the messages we're communicating and the expectations we're setting for our employees? And what I mean by that, what I'm getting at is a concept of competing priorities. So let's take um, an example where, um, and actually I saw this occurring, a rental car agency. I, was, I flew into Kansas City, and I saw um, the guy in front of me was dealing with a customer and sent the customer on his way. And I knew he had to input a bunch more things um, from the customer account, probably a loyalty account or something of that nature, to get in the computer um, and get processed before uh, he could he could deal with, with my request. And I kind of watched him. He's between the computer, look it up at me. So if I wasn't somewhat cognizant of what he was actually doing, I'm thinking, why am I still standing here, man? And ultimately what I figured out was he was left between a choice. Either I, in, I input all this customer information from that last customer so that he can be properly serviced. Let's say he gets in an accident or, um, uh, something goes wrong with a car or when he ch checks the car back in, those people on the other side are, have all the information about him. That he's inputting on the back end, making sure that it's all lined up right. Or he can make he can essentially take me right away so that he's now engaged with me um, and kind of risks the, you know, the customer's information from prior. So now this individual's left with a choice, right? Either leave me on the island for a while and get the get the data in right, or take me right away and risk uh, a data you know a data issue, a data inaccuracy issue in, in inputting it. So ultimately, what tends to happen when we have when we have these competing priorities is we go law of least effort, and we essentially select the one that has the lowest level of risk that something bad can happen. And if if especially so if we create like an incentives program that's all about I get rewarded based on how somebody evaluates my performance and satisfaction with how I, how I handle their situation, right? So if that's, the, that's my target, then I don't care about inputting the data right for everybody else. Come on, next customer up. Let's go because that's my, that's my priority, right? So when they have to choose, we put them in a really uh, inconvenient situation and over time, that's going to build up and, and we're not going to have a good read on their performance, ultimately. And if our messages aren't consistent and we have communication inc incongruence, mixed messages are going to throw people into saying, OK, what am I supposed to do now? And if they're forced to choose, not only is it exhausting, but I, I just no one's really set on the right course for, for the company's culture and the vision of what you're trying to accomplish. Yeah, I love that. I love the idea of driving greater clarity around kind of what to do and expectations so people know what they need to be doing and even going down the level of uh, prioritization in case you've got conflict. So it, make, it makes me think, you know, um, when, I'm, when I'm doing time talking about culture, I often will talk about uh, Magic Kingdom at Disney World because they've got, yeah. they've got every cast member is trained on four values, safety, courtesy, show, and efficiency. 
Mm -hmm. safety, courtesy, show, and efficiency. And what's really unique about the way they do it is they have those ranked ordered that way. So mm -hmm. they know, so, so their employees know, their cast members know what to trade off. So you never trade off a safety issue. Yeah. And, and, and then you go to courtesy and then you can, you know, but courtesy trumps efficiency, but then yeah. you can go to then show, make it a big show. And then lastly, efficiency. Um, and what, all are important, but they, but they prioritize them. So you know what to do when you're faced with that decision with that customer, yeah. which path do I pick? And what I love about that is, is it, you're still not making robots out of people. Yeah. Like I, I, I'm giving you a rule set, but it, as long as you're playing by that decision tree of rules, you can still be this great performer, right? You can still offer unique experience. Like you, that's, that's what's beautiful about what Disney does in those parks is like, as long as you play by our pay, pay, you know, pay to play rules here, like extend yourself, like create that experience for, for our customers and, and our visitors and the like. That's awesome. That's, that's just a great, great tie in. Yeah. Yeah. That's beautiful. Okay, great. All right. So then now we've, we've added clarity um, around that and clarity around decision-making, you know, and, and right. so that's, that's beautiful. Um, what would be something else that we want to be on the lookout for that we want to make sure we've kind of gotten our, in our system. And if we don't, people might be hitting the curb. So here's one that I often I bring up that seems subtle and small, but most of these things tend to be, if, if an employee, uh, so like ultimately, like what you're really looking for is any deviation from norm, right? If you know what they're, what, how they typically behave and, um, and the like, and now we see some deviation, something's usually off, right? But let's take something like it normally takes this individual two days to, to populate a report or um, get some account plan done or something of that nature. Now it's taking five, six, seven, right? It begs a few questions. Number one, are they doing this because they have nothing else to do? So they're dragging it on because they have to look busy. Um, or number two is some new process been injected that I don't know about that is now costing this individual time and thus ability to, to be creative and adaptive. So I'll start with the first one. If, if these individuals are dragging on something because they have nothing else to do, it, think about the last time you went to an event you just didn't want to be there, right? You're actually bringing out, you're putting on a performance and you're bringing out emotions that are non-natural. You're mm -hmm. forcing emotion. And when you do that, you're suppressing your natural emotions and you're actually exhausting willpower. You are like, you, you come back from that thing and you're just completely wiped. You're exhausted mm -hmm. because you've had to, you've had to be something that you're not right. Mm -hmm. Like they show that actors, when they actors and actresses, when, when they're in character, their brains are fired off differently and it's exhausting. It's the same thing here. So if we act like we're working, we're actually, we're like seven to eight times less efficient cognitively and emotionally and, and the like than we are if we're actually working. Wow. So <laughs> that's a big risk factor for these folks. So, so if I got nothing to do, what am I doing? Yeah. Wow. That's wow. So, I bet, so going back to that, I think, I think the, what starts us down this path of discovery is that Q all right, this used to be a two-day task. Now it's five, six, seven. What's going on? So mm -hmm. I think it, it begs this idea of just getting curious. Start to look for those kinds of patterns and get curious about that. And, right. And try and discover that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Anything else you think we should be on the lookout for? Yeah, I'll have one more. And, and this, is, this can be tough for managers to hear, but, but I think they need to hear it. How much control does an employee have over their day and week, and most importantly, their ability to, to actually execute on how they're evaluating their performance, their deadlines? I love to say, like, in today's episode of This Could Have Been an Email, right? So Harvard Business Review came out with this calculator, and it's all the people that are in a meeting, how long the meeting is, and then the salary of each person. Now, you can see how much money is being spent on that individual meeting. Yep. And then you look around and you say – wow, we've been in here an hour, we've accomplished nothing, it cost us this, and this could have been an email. So you take somebody who has all these deadlines, right? I have to get up, get some plan done by Friday. But Tuesday, I have five meetings for four hours. Wednesday, I have three meetings for four hours. And Friday, I have six meetings for, for five hours. Yeah. When's the actual work get? Yeah, yeah. Right? So, I mean, it's kind of one of those things where they have, you have to take a step back and say, are all, are all these things we're doing here necessary? And you talked about the 3 billion mark and like the public traded world. You're, you see a lot of that. Like, yeah. why are we doing this? It's right. Great, so great 
in, in, again, in today's episode of this could have been an email. Um, <laughs> I just, I, I love to hit that one. I, you know, I, and I said the same thing about kind of looking at the hourly rates of the folks in the room and imagining a taxi cab meter running. Um, you know, there's no real good rule of thumb. I like to use kind of in the um, graduate school world. I think you could relate to this. Whenever we would give kind of homework to um, students, graduate students, it was always kind of like the rule of thumb used to be for an hour, every hour in the classroom, one hour of prep work would, would be what they'd have to do, kind of a one-to-one ratio. Mm-hmm. And I like that applying to meetings. So it should be for every one hour in meetings you have in a given day, you should be giving at least an hour to accomplish work, which yeah. means you should never have more than four hours of meetings in a day. Yeah. And you and I both know people that are consumed with meetings all day long. Oh, it's like, man. It's like, when are, you, when are you actually doing anything? And you can't yeah. be prepared for the meeting because you just came out of another meeting. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I, I don't see how you're going to actually execute on anything you just committed to do. There's no time oh, I, to do I, it. I've got clients that'll be on three calls at, at the same time yeah, oh, and, and they'll ridiculous. jump from one and, and say, hey, ridiculous. Okay, I got that, and then jump to the next one. And it's in their, their like their calendars, their calendars get booked for them. Yeah. It's yeah. like, if you control my calendar, that's probably number one. And I, I have no control over what my, what my day looks like. Yeah, so. I absolutely. I, I love it. Well, we've already gotten close to time, John. This is, this awesome. is amazing. I mean, we could have been going for, we, I, we'll have to do this again. So, yeah. so uh, I always ask all my guests this question. What's one life hack you have for us to help us live a life more free from dysfunction? So I really like to, I've, I've gotten really obsessive with my Apple watch and trying to hit my three rings a day. Hmm. And it's not necessarily for fitness. It's not for, it, it's for consistency. So if you're striving for something, no matter how what your day looks like, do one thing to get closer to that target every day to maintain some level of consistency about it. Yeah. I love that. That's great. Just that, just that consistent, diligent, disciplined effort. Yeah. Yep. I love it. That's great. Well, if people want to learn more about you and the great work you're up to, where can they go? Yeah. So, um, www.sparksresearch.com is our full service marketing research firm. www.sparksresearch.com ins and outs that's i-n-s-a-n-d-o-u-t-s dot org uh is the insight generation company we're also producing a podcast series ourselves uh talking all about machine learning and insight generation the like uh called the modern polymath that should be coming out at the end of next week so um i can't thank you enough for having me this has yeah. been awesome I, I hope we do it again i would love to um yeah yeah this is great. Uh, fantastic. I, I really I keep up all the great work of what you're doing and I would love to love to have you on the show again. And, and thank you for watching and listening to the show. Uh, yeah. Of course, follow follow the show every 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 su- Sunday when we drop a new show, 730. And for those that haven't gotten a chance to check out the website, check out the workplace therapist.com. Great resource for additional uh, resources to help you have a life more free from dysfunction. And if you all love the show today, which John and I certainly hope you did. Please feel free to rate, review, and subscribe to the episodes. That's how people find out about the show and the tribe gets a little bit bigger. And until our next show, have a great week and an awesome life.